Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today here at Kinder Church. I'm so glad that you're spending this time with us today on New Year's. Uh, and uh, as we're thinking about New Year's, it's a great time to talk about New Year's-y kind of stuff, and like purpose and meaning. So what gives life meaning, like real meaning? This is a question that has um, kind of plagued humanity in a lot of ways, more than any other question uh, for thousands of years, what gives life meaning? If not by words, uh, a lot of people's actions would say that money, that money gives life meaning. They might not vocally say that, but by the way they do things, that's the way they're living out that idea of purpose. Uh, and connected to that same premise as money, others would say it's the accumulation of stuff, right? I think there's uh, plenty of evidence of that as we look around in our own lives and in the lives of other people, especially people that we follow on uh, social media, uh, TV and whatnot. Um, and then there's the opposite side of the spectrum, where some would say rather than money or uh, stuff. It would be a life of ease, uh, a life without stress, and whatever it takes to have uh, very little of those things is what real meaning comes from. Others would say that um, enjoying a really good meal is meaningful, or uh, maybe a cold beer. But deep down, none of these things really make us happy, uh, at least not long term. They might give us some momentary happiness, but not anything that's going to last a significant amount of time. If your purpose is found in um, having a nice car, well, sooner or later that nice car is going to get old and you're going to have to buy another car. So, uh, so what really gives life meaning and purpose and where can uh, it be found today? This morning and then for the next couple of weeks, I want us to try and answer that question. Uh, it's a, a difficult question to answer in some regards, but it's also very simple. What really gives us meaning in life? Um, and to do this, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture that is known by most people. Even people who aren't followers of Christ, uh, those who aren't believers, they probably are familiar with this passage of the Bible. It's one of the most profound and moving um, passages in the entire Bible, and I believe it really gets to the heart of where uh, life and the church finds its ultimate purpose, uh, because without it, life is pretty miserable. If you don't have this one thing, life is pretty awful. I want to share with you a few stories to illustrate what I mean. I've been working in ministry for about 25 years now, and I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with a wide variety of teens. Um, many of these kids are very smart, uh, intelligent people. Uh, they're academically successful. Some of them are very privileged kids, um, but they a lot of times feel utterly lost and totally empty. Um, there was one person that really stands out as an example of what I'm talking about. When I met her, she was uh, 14 or 15 years old. She was very bright, very personable, kind-hearted person. But she was also highly pressured by her parents. Uh, I mean, they loved her dearly, but they were frequently preoccupied by uh, education and career and ultimately being perfect. Uh, she had to be, this child felt she had to be perfect in all things. And as a result, this young lady was, was very angry all the time. But after spending some time and talking over, you know, a few months period, uh, she began to trust me. But then all of a sudden, just kind of out of nowhere, she stopped um, attending youth group events for a while. <clears throat> so I called her I asked if she wanted to go to Panera Bread and talk and just catch up. And at first, she seemed kind of reluctant, as most teenagers probably would be. But she was willing. And then after 
And when she walked in, um, she was wearing this long sleeve t-shirt that was pulled up like halfway down her, her hands. And she had torn the seam out of the cuff so she could stick her thumbs um, through. Uh, and, you know, that kind of put up some uh, warnings in my mind. You know, she could have done that because she was cold or maybe because she liked the look. But from my experience, uh, it told me that this person is trying to cover something up and doesn't want to accidentally reveal whatever it is. So after talking for a few minutes, she wanted to show me something um, on her arm. And then she pulled up her sleeves and explained that she had been using a razor uh, recently to cut. Um, now, she wasn't trying to end her life, uh, but she had hundreds of little cuts all over her arms. And at the center of these lines, they all kind of converged on this one word that she had carved into her arm. That word was empty. This teenage girl, who from a, a consumeristic perspective, had everything she needed to be happy, uh, content. Uh, she had the newest technology, uh, best clothes, financially generous parents, but she felt completely and totally empty inside. So empty that she carved that word into her arm. Now, I was able to help her and uh, her family to find a therapist to talk to because that kind of stuff is beyond my scope. Uh, I pointed her in the right direction, but she needed professional help. They needed professional help. But this young person genuinely felt empty inside and had no idea what to do to fix that. Uh, but this isn't just a teen issue. We like to point fingers at teens for doing these kind of things. But, you know, this issue is seen uh, among a wide variety of people. Years ago, before Bree and I came to La Mesa, uh, we interviewed at a church in Vero Beach, Florida. And while there, we stayed with the, the pastor of that church and his wife. And uh, the first or second night after we ate dinner, we sat in their living room and I asked them to tell us about Vero Beach's biggest need. Um, he said that Vero Beach, uh, if you don't know where I'm talking about, it's about halfway, if you're looking at Florida, it's about halfway up the coast on uh, the Atlantic side. Um, he said it's one of the most beautiful spots in the world, especially if you're into sports fishing or golfing. He said it was kind of a golfer's nirvana. And he said many of these golfers, which was about 65% of the population of Vero Beach, they were uh, former CEOs of major corporations or some were partners in some New York law firm, and they moved to Vero Beach to retire. And he went on to explain that there were over 27 golf courses there. There were miles of sparkling beaches and some of the best country clubs in the world. Um, and these, he said, these people that are in those country clubs and on those golf courses, they are very powerful, very driven people. And he said, they all kind of have this, what he referred to as a, a New York look on their face. Uh, they were very determined in everything they did. They were very determined, but now all of a sudden they're trying to measure their lives by how many golf games they can fit in a week. Uh, and he went on to say that there have been a couple occasions where he had a chance to, to talk to them. And in those moments, he likes to ask, do you really, this is his question, do you really want to live your life counting up the numbers of times you can chase that little white ball around the greens? And usually he said these, you know, types of people would just kind of chuckle at you. But in some instances, it was a nervous chuckle because... In the six months that they had been retired and playing golf, they had realized just how boring, just how empty their lives truly were. Uh, now, they all had beautiful homes, uh, the best cars. Um, 
They had everything the world would say is the dream for success. Uh, they had homes that were more of castles, in his words than mine, uh, but they uh, were bored. And when they were bored, they would just move on to something else. But oftentimes, what they fail to see, just like that teen girl, is why. Why they feel so empty. Because it is this emptiness that drives people to look for something, right? You know, she was looking for something to make her feel more whole. Uh, These CEOs and lawyers were looking for something that would make them feel more whole. And they were trying to fill it with very worldly things. Uh, You know, some people hurt themselves. Some people uh, fill their lives with stuff. And we run all kinds of places looking for that thing. Whatever that thing is, we want to do something that's going to give life meaning. We want to have something that's going to make life feel less empty. But a lot of times we look in the wrong places. You know, let me illustrate. As parents, you know, we want our children to do well in their studies. You know, that's not anything new. All parents want their kids to do well in school so they can get a good job, so they can move out, and so they can be successful in their own lives. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. In fact, when keeping those things in the the right perspective, they are all very good things. Uh, It is good to study hard in school. It's good to find a a job that you can be successful in. It's good to become a successful adult. But if we measure the success um, of our lives on education and job and subdivisions, We're missing out. We're missing out on the most critical, the most crucial ingredient in wholeness. Because if we focus on education and jobs and subdivisions and all that stuff, we're still going to feel empty at the end of the day because we're missing the most crucial ingredient. We'd be missing out on the one thing which makes everything else in our lives and everything in the church worthwhile and meaningful. And when you miss out on these things in life, we miss out on what's most important. And that's love. We miss out on the love of God and we miss out ultimately in being able to really be and love people. Because we focus on the wrong stuff. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. That's where we're going to be focusing today and for the next couple of weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 uh, is powerful. Um, in this letter, Paul, he was addressing a church in Corinth, and this was a really spiritual uh, group of folks. Today, we would refer to the church at Corinth as being a charismatic church. They had people speaking in tongues. They had people standing up during worshiping, and they were prophesying. Some believed that they were more spiritual than others because they had a special kind of knowledge, uh, otherwise known as Gnosticism. Others got all uppity about how much faith they had and looked down on others while they were new to the faith, or they looked down on those who were struggling a bit more than them. And the whole church was in some kind of weird competition over spiritual gifts. That's really what it came down to. They were competing over who had the most impressive spiritual gifts. Even during the the Lord's Supper, there was this same kind of competition. Um, The Lord's Supper back then was quite a bit different than what we experience today. They called it an agape feast. It was more of a a kind of a potluck that they would have. But the problem is that those who brought food, they weren't sharing it with those who couldn't afford to bring food. So in chapter 11, Paul addressing this issue directly, he says, each of you goes ahead and eats a private meal. One person goes hungry while another is drunk. So there's a lot of not so great of stuff that's happening in the church in Corinth. Uh, They as a church were richly blessed with all kinds of spiritual gifts, 
But just like, just like that teen girl that I talked about, just like all those retired CEOs and lawyers, no one was really happy. No one was really content with their lives. Paul says that they were, uh, there were divisions, that there were cliques. Now, from the outside looking in, they appeared to be very spiritual. You know, if we visited them today, they would appear to be a very spiritual, a very alive group. But if you dug beneath the surface, you would find that they were really very empty. Um, I think that is the way it is with a lot of churches even today. Uh, many have the appearance of godliness. I mean, I visit a lot of churches that have the appearance of godliness. But they're really missing out on the power. And without the power of God in our lives and in our churches, what good is spirituality? Uh, our churches could be doing so much more if only we grasped the power of God. The church has the potential to be so much more effective than it is, but unfortunately, we often get distracted, right? We become far more concerned with uh, and outside appearances than we are with loving God and loving our neighbor. Um, many churches are only concerned with their uh, expensive buildings, with the best LED signs out by the front, uh, their bigger, their larger building projects, and the programs that they offer only for their members. But this isn't meant to be our number one concern. There's nothing inherently wrong with a building or a sign or a building project or programs for members. But they can't be the number one thing. They can't be the number one ingredient uh, in our lives and in our churches. We need to be constantly asking ourselves, what is our focus? Where is our focus? What do we really care about? How are we expressing these things to the community around us? Are we acting uh, self-absorbed? Are we in competition with one another? Or are we just another social club that's out there in the world? Do we allow some but exclude others? Um, are there people who are considered on the inside and there's others who are considered on the outside? Do we get caught up in hot-button political or social fights that these have become our gods, because that happens a lot of times. We have turned uh, political agendas and social agendas into false idols, and maybe that's a problem that some churches or people find. How are we spending our money as individuals? How are we spending money as a church? Are we spending our resources on telling people that what they're doing is wrong while we're walking around with a big old stake sticking out of our eye, a big old plank sticking out of our eye. These are the things, these things simply are not meant to be a part of a church's focus. All that stuff, all that worldly stuff isn't meant to be a part of what we focus on. Imagine, just let's play a pretend game for just a moment. Imagine if all the self-professed Christians in La Mesa and the greater San Diego community came together. And they were united by this one thing. They were united by this one thing that according to Jesus and Paul and all the other apostles, that it triumphs over all the other things. This idea of love. What if we were united by real godly love? What could we accomplish? What could all the Christians in the San Diego area accomplish if we were united in loving people? the way that Jesus says we ought to. Well, there probably wouldn't be any more homelessness. Let's just be real honest on that one. There probably wouldn't be any more homelessness. There probably wouldn't be any more children without proper clothes or a permanent roof over their heads or food in their bellies. What could we accomplish? What could God accomplish through us if we were living according to the principles that Paul set forth in 1 Corinthians 13. I think the easiest way to imagine it is that Christ's kingdom 
would be heaven on earth. But most of the time, we just walk around like a bunch of blindfolded Christians, ignoring all the people who aren't a part of our everyday lives. And we spend so much time fighting with one another that we can't or don't or won't live out Jesus' mission for the church. And that is the problem that Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians 13. These people in Corinth, they were narcissistic. They were self-absorbed. They had missed what was truly important. They were really good at majoring in the minors, as a professor of mine used to say. They were really good at focusing on the stuff that really isn't that important. And they missed out on the most important thing. They missed out on the number one key ingredient. So Paul says to them in verse 1 of chapter 13, If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I am a clanging gong or a clashing symbol. In other words, without real, genuine love, all the charismatic speaking in tongues that happens in some of these churches out there uh, is just a bunch of good-for-nothing, annoying noise if it's not preceded by love. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, I ultimately have nothing. Talk about deflating somebody's ego there, right? If I know everything there is to know about God and have the kind of faith that Jesus said could move mountains, but I fail to love, all that other stuff is just useless. And I, myself, am nothing. Then Paul goes even a a step further and says in verse 3, If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done. Now notice what he's saying there. There's all these these me-centric words in this passage, right? If I hand over my body to feel good about what I've done, but I have no love, I have received no benefit whatsoever. Those are harsh words. These people were self-absorbed, narcissistic, and Paul is calling them out. All this stuff that you're focused on doesn't matter because you don't have the number one ingredient. You don't have love in your life. And then Paul goes into the meat of this text and the part that we're probably most familiar with but rarely practice. Beginning in verse 4, Paul begins talking about and describing that one thing. He begins describing what kind of love he is talking about. The kind of love that is meant to define the Christian life and give the Christian life and the church its ultimate meaning. He talks about the one thing that that teen girl, he talks about the one thing that teen girl and all those CEOs were missing from their lives, and that is love, real love. But what does Paul mean? He says in verse 4 through 7, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own ways. It is not irritable, but it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And line by line by line, it becomes so clear And perhaps the best thing that we can do with a passage like that is to look at it slowly and to take it one line at a time and reflect on three questions, okay? As you read this passage, reflect on these three questions. In what ways do we see these qualities in Jesus' life? That's question one. Question two is, in what ways do we see or not see these qualities in our own lives. And question number three, if we were to embody these qualities of love in our lives, how would we be transformed? How different would our lives be 
if we genuinely loved people the way Paul is talking about. And we're going to be talking about that over the next three weeks together. But what does it mean to really love? Unfortunately, that word for us um, kind of has a lot of problems intertwined with the English language because we only have one word for it. I mean, the love Paul talked about isn't the same thing when I say that I love the MCU or I love sushi or I love going on long road trips or anything like that. So I want us to wrap up today by thinking about what this life of love would be like. Try and imagine what it would feel like to live a life that was defined by being patient and kind. Think about what that would be like. How different would your life be if it was defined by being patient and kind? To live a life that isn't jealous. A life that isn't jealous and does not brag. A life that isn't arrogant or rude. A life that doesn't seek its own advantage or isn't irritable. A life that doesn't keep a record of complaints, nor is it happy with injustice. But a life that celebrates truth. Imagine living a life that puts up with all things, a life that hopes in all things, that endures all things. Imagine what it would be like to have a life that was filled with this kind of love that never fails. What steps would you be willing to take today to make that life possible? Because that life that Paul's talking about, that love that he's promising, is available today, but what steps would you take to make it possible? Choosing this life of love is not only optimal. This life of love is the only way a Christian can truly live. Do you understand that? We don't get to pick and choose the things that we're most comfortable with. If we're calling ourselves Christians, our life has to be, it must be defined by these things. That doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes and we don't slip up, but when somebody looks at the way we live our lives, they have to be able to say, yes, I would say all those things are true about them. And if you don't have those characteristics defining your life, then you have to ask yourself, where did I go wrong? And what must I do to change? I want to close with uh, something that in a person that was called uh, N.T. Wright. He wrote this, Love is God's river, and it flows into the future. It flows where there is no pride, no jostling for position, no contention among God's people. We are all invited to step into that river of love, and once we have wetted our toes, we need to let it take us, take us wherever it leads. So love, this love that Jesus talked about, this love that Paul talked about, this is the one thing that gives life real meaning. This one thing, this love is the only thing that will ever make you feel fulfilled. It's the only thing that will make you feel like you have a life of purpose. But will you embrace it? Will you embrace love? Because without it, nothing else really matters. Without love, it's just a life of emptiness. I pray that you cling to the love of God today. We'll talk to you next time.